Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we are bringing you day 540 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. This time with Alexei Rostovich, former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel, and Yulia Latinina, Russian investigative journalist currently in exile. To address a bunch of questions about whether Mark's and Alexei's streams will continue, they currently have made a decision to not and we will be following Alexei on other platforms as we do appreciate his intel and interesting angle and input into the events unfolding in Ukraine, as well as we'll trace other interviews and, as you know, any interesting material that pops on the radar that deserves to be translated, we shall do that. Also, special thanks to Jamer, thank you for the super thanks, and of course to our faithful members, Klaus Preditis, John F. Seth, Carolyn G., Olga Lewis, and Velas Inc., We'll be naming some of you every stream. So with this, let's go dive into day 540. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. This is Yulia Latina and Alexei Rostovich, as it often happens on Thursdays. Hello, Alexei. Hi. Do not forget to subscribe to our Modest Latina TV. Since uh, tracking the stats, we know that most of you are watching without subscription. And of course, subscribe to Alexei Rostovich if you have not done that yet, and to the Privateer Station if you are listening or watching that in English. And do not forget to share, like, and click those buttons uh, in order to help the stream to get higher. I wanted to start with some strategic questions, but apparently there are some interesting news from the front, because near Urajane there are some martyrs noticed, and the challengers as well. Ukraine has not brought in some of these nomenclature items into the fight, so potentially that may be the direction of the main effort. And I also heard uh, that today two K-52 were downed in that area. And from what I'm hearing is that the problem of uh, minefields, Ukraine started to resolve with uh, cluster munitions. And then counter-battery fire also was very effective to destroy Russian artillery and K-52 was uh, a difficult problem and apparently since two of them went down Ukraine has found an interesting key to that and after that there were tanks noticed is it a coincidence or let's go in orderly fashion so one of the K-52s were shot down near Abutina another was uh, shot down near Bakhmut so that's not a southern front that's a different story the main advantage of K-52 is ability to launch anti-tank missiles from a longer distance, from about 8 kilometers, where usual anti-aircraft systems do not reach the mobile ones that infantry has with them. And even for ASA and the others, this is the longest distance they can reach. So, in general, this is one of the few examples of the newer Russian arms that give us certain grief. But when our troops are moving forward, and they're moving forward near Rabotina and near Urajaina, and the Eastern Front is moving as well, so when troops start to move against each other, and they change the outline of the front, there are a lot of counterattacks on both sides. They mix their positions, and situations often change. So. When KA-52 is going up, a certain part of the front may belong to Ukraine, but by the time it gets to the front line, that's, that area might be already uh, under Russia, or the other way around. So one way for them to figure things out, where the enemy is, is to get closer to the front and try to investigate. Because the original idea of that K-52 was to protect the columns of tanks, uh, when the Soviet Union was planning to send a stream of tanks into Europe, KA-52s would be defending them and would be hovering above the col columns and destroying enemy approaching them. So normal, normal their situation is that it would be hanging up somewhere, even if in the videos you can see in Telegram, it would be hanging out somewhere at night and picking up Ukrainian targets from afar, from 8 to 10 kilometers away. And when active events unfold during the daytime and K-52s are being thrown to support their troops when they're counterattacking, they have to come much closer to the front line because you cannot just stay in the back. It's very difficult to select the right target. 
So they come closer to the battlefront, and that's when the portable anti-air systems get a chance. Because we do have them in our troops, amongst them. And today we've seen a video that's uh, 48 Brigade shot down K-52. I would say up front it is one of the most expensive weapons that Russian army has. They have hundred. Uh, they had about 140. People name different numbers, but roughly 100 plus items, uh, 100 plus uh, K-52s they had at the beginning of war. According to all the data gathered for today, we already have shot down about a half. This is very difficult to replenish the source, so they're definitely feeling the pain there. And it was a similar situation in Bakhmut when they had to approach the front line closer, and that's when they were destroyed. And interesting to observe the Western press when well, now they're starting to talk about, oh wait, Ukraine has some successes on the front, perhaps they will succeed in pushing further down south, because there was a lot of skepsis on the Western uh, side in the press. And I want to say that the Russian front in the south, it was a gradual work. It's not broken yet, but it's definitely crumbling. Why? Uh, southern front looks like a trapezoid. And this is generally speaking. Um, and as our troops go down south further, the line that Russia has to pay attention to becomes wider. And their troops have fewer and fewer capabilities there because they already wasted a bunch of their soldiers to try in trying to destroy our forces before they get to the main defense lines where there were minefields, traps, and they were shooting uh, our equipment, our armored vehicles with K-52s. Some of the infantry uh, were sitting there and uh, holding their place till they were all dead. But in the situation when we face the enemy that does this uh, strategy, we have chosen a different tactics. We, instead of pushing, we were basically baiting them and trying to show them the target when they would be shooting at us with the artillery and they would be destroying them, taking them out. Then they tried bringing MLRS systems instead of artillery. They lost a bunch of those uh, MLRS systems as well and uh, there were a lot of them recorded on video. Smerch and Rogans were uh, destroyed. And now they're bringing also K-52s as well, because they're running out of other opportunities to suppress our tanks and other armor with uh, other means. And now we are in the phase, basically it's the battle of reserves, remember? The one who touches the reserves first will, will lose. And at the beginning, I, you know, I wasn't confirming, even though we started it back on the 4th of June. Uh, even by the 6th, we we're not really officially claiming that we did. So Russian defense is going there now through several stages. First, they had deep reserves, they had the line in front of their defense uh, fortifications. Then, as our troops were proceeding forward, they started to and they started, and Russians started losing some of the positions, they started to replenish and take and grab from some of the reserves and plug them into different parts of the front. Very generally speaking, one unit would report they've lost 50 people, they would grab these 50 from reserves and put them to plug back in. Then they started to feel the pressure so much that they actually had to ro start rotating their troops. They would be withdrawing the whole troop from the front and then bringing it back. Unfortunately for them now, the pace of uh, war is such that they don't have time to really rotate properly. They don't have enough time to rest. And about two weeks ago they touched upon their strategic reserves, what is called strategic reserves. So the reserves can be divided in tactical, battalion to company, then operative, brigade level and detachment, and then strategic were divisions and corps. And 70th division was on the strategic and now they have they've been trying to make two armies and also 40th uh, army corps but 40th now they canceled it because they are now they're tearing 40th apart and parts of it going to support 18th army and that 70th division that replaced the paratroopers on the left bank of Don they strictly speaking are not really battle ready battle worthy even though they were dumped to the 
secondary important to the front of secondary importance they are still facing some of our special services and some of our territorial defense units there. This is a very descriptive of what's happening. They are basically tearing apart the not fully formed army to support their current troops on the front. Remember how initially we spent weeks and months to move for a mile. Last, mi last week our troops were moving non-stop on the south. Maybe not for long distance, but every day they were moving further. And now, for the first time, we are facing a situation when Russians are counterattacking, but they cannot stop us. And earlier, we were doing it differently. We had to attack, we captured some territory, they counterattacked with force, so sometimes they even pushed us out, so we had to take it back. And now, near Robotina, our friends are telling me that the houses are basically, each house is being fought for and Russians are being pushed out. Russian command has one weakness I want to talk about. It is known, it's not a secret. Remember how we started? We started on three different directions, and a lot of people were giggling, saying, why Ukrainians are starting on three different directions on the southern front? You should have gathered into one single fist to test, right? To test the front line and to pull the reserves a little. I told you, Leah, that you think a little uh, sharper than a lot of... Uh, military analysts, and I want to give you a separate compliment about your uh, intellectual capacity. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that there are three different directions that they saw, and they took reserves apart to support those three parts of the front, because one of their templates is to make sure they push the enemy back to support the front line as it was before the activity. So they were throwing reserves and they were wasting them in these attempts. And then evil Ukrainians all of a sudden at the fourth direction, right at the moment when all the reserves are already taken to support uh, those two other possible motions. So they take more reserves and they dump them into the fourth direction. The moment the fourth slows down and they're somewhat happy that they paused and stopped the Ukrainian offensive, we add a fifth direction. And now they have five, and the moment they start to wiggle, they get six. And when you have six, it's a very specific story. What do you do when Ukraine has success in three out of six directions? And we keep shifting the area of main effort. The moment Russians think that they have stopped us, we change the direction. We're not even changing the main effort, we just change uh, the area that we become more active at. And they have then to drag their reserves to 70 kilometers to another place to try to stop us there. And somewhat the moment uh, they kind of stopped us there at the new place, there are news coming from another area where Ukraine is uh, activating again. And they are running out of reserves and time to move and shift their troops. Plus, we're also moving in that wedge formation the front being it broke being broken that it, front becomes wider and longer and the operative density in order to hold us is growing that minimum number that they need in order to hold us is growing and sooner or later these pants will tear apart and this is another error that uh, russian command has given that in russian school the officers are trained in a matter that they're not really welcome when they bring bad news to their main to their to their leadership so they are not reporting real numbers and when the front will start cracking when it will be very close to breaking they would exactly like chernobyl they will not tell that anything happened right they'll wait and they'll be late in their inform information upstream and then after that it'll be a bit late to make any significant decisions so what are we talking about in the south urajaina between urajaina and zavetnajlanya the next village. It's 800 yards. It's just one field. And all these new pieces that they noticed, that's there. And what's 800 yards, right? And from Urajaina to the middle of Staromlinovka. And Staromlinovka basically would mean that uh, we have crossed the first line of defenses that they were fortifying. That's only six kilometers. So mortars can reach it. Now they have more reserves trying to dig new trenches beyond Staromlinovka. But I want to remind that it's people who are defending the fortifications, not the lines themselves. You can dig 700 lines of fortifications, but if you don't have enough troops, and by the way, they did not have enough troops, their operative density was low from the very beginning of this southern operation, when every Putin soldier was still alive, they already were low. 
by the numbers, by the metrics to support that front. So what do you think will happen now? I will not say that it will crumble tomorrow, but in some legible terms, I would say closer probably within a month, things will start to collapse in many parts of it. And we are already noticing that Ukraine troops starting to move non-stop every day. Before we used to do a little motion, stop, fortify, hold it, and then move a few days later again. And now we're moving daily. And more than that, it seemed that in Vasilevska they stopped us, but even there we're pushing further. And they never know where the main line of attack will happen, the main effort will happen. We're sort of uh, using these blinking lights we were blinking in one part of the front, the other part of the front, the third part of the front. And you know, it's easy to understand the level of training of the unit when by asking them to show, to demonstrate how can they move their efforts from one flank to another. You know, when the soldiers are being trained, when one soldier is running and shooting, then two or three of them, then a platoon is working. Then the testing question is, can you shift your effort from one flank to another? And if you can do it in a battle, in battle, that basically is somewhat a good training already. That's a notable level that you can fight with. And of course, our army has a lot of deficiencies. I can talk about those for hours, but on the operative level, we have very good thinking command and definitely at least one head above the Russians. And we're outplaying them time and time again on the operative level. We played them near Kiev in the north when they retreated and in Kherson area, and here we'll win as well. It's just conditions are more difficult, but we will prevail and we'll get to the sea. And not even just to the sea, strategic part will begin when Volnavaha, Melitopol and the railroad will be within reach. And it's right there under Staromenovka, very close to it. So logistics under Takmak gets hit, right? Everywhere, everywhere you learn. The war basically is done for the maps of railroads. Modern warfare traces the railroad maps, especially where there are big junctions. And if you look at the map of railroads of Ukraine and you follow from Volnavaha how it goes to Melitopol, this is the second railroad. There are only two that go to Crimea to the south. One goes through the bridge down south in Crimea, another is this one and it goes uh, all the way to Kherson and Berdyansk. So, how can I say that? Their uh, FUBAR will start to come in their dreams rather soon, uh, even weeks before we get to the sea, to the seashore. And given that we're already attacking some of the Chungar communication lines, and the problem of the left bank is still there, right? So we will finish them, we'll eat them there, and probably by October, maybe November, I actually should remind that Kherson was taken in November. So all these scary stories about November are not valid in relation to South. So of course weather matters, but I think till November we have at least two months, at least two good months there that we can keep actively pushing the front line. And when they're writing in their media that, oh, they brought in 82nd and 46th, these are the last Ukrainian reserves, after that they cannot proceed further, I want to say that there'll be a surprise of all their lives awaiting for them in regards to our reserves capacities in the south. So everything will be good, everything will be timely, if to speak about the southern front. This is the, to describe the phase that's there. You know, Alexei, when you started talking about the attacks on different parts of the fronts, like flashing lights, I remembered how the Roman Empire died, because I think the main problem at the beginning of 5th century of Roman Empire was not in some huge groups of vandals, barbarians and gods attacking them. The groups were rather small, but it was a very contagious activity. The moment some roaming gang of gods decided to rob a part of Roman Empire, some other group of vandals of Franks popped up on the radar saying, oh, we want to partake in that too. And just as Roman Empire got enough numbers from basically same Germans, some uh, somebody will go visit Europe, get more of the barbarians recruited and then go break those bands, those gangs that are attacking them. 
then new and new attacks flare up on different parts of the empire. And from that uh, torture by a thousand cuts, the biggest empire collapsed as a result of it. Well, the Roman Empire died when they started building limits or lines and fortification systems when they cannot advance and transport theorem was uh, being resolved not in their favor. Even the best orders uh, birthed in Rome were too late till they arrived to the front or to the border. And the second one was when I think when they started recruiting barbarians to serve in the army. When barbarians became colonels, sergeants and commanders of Roman or generals of the Roman army. They knew all the strong parts or the weak parts of the army. You basically take a spy to serve in your army. And the destruction in Tiftabor forest, who destroyed them? Who was one of the guys who served to the rank of colonel with the Roman Empire? Well, in this case, one can say they died in the first century, because that forest was early enough, like two centuries before that. I would say it started collapsing early enough. It's a huge empire and it takes a long time to fully collapse. And even if there was a smart Dertilian who managed to divide it into four parts and then it divided into two parts, in some fashion Roman Empire didn't really die. It died fully only when the Byzantium was taken, because that's basically an Eastern Roman Empire that existed for a thousand years after the Western. Yep, I had a big video that gathered about a million views about that empire. Alexei, can I argue with you about the barbarians? Sure. This is a very thin moment, I think, because a very peculiar aspect. Because just like the weeds, which often grow near the fields the, uh, where the crops are grown, so the barbarians on the borders of empires, they're not exactly barbarians. They're very specific kinds of tribes, especially uh, looking at the military part of them, that is very fine-tuned to either serve the empire or to rob the empire. So when the empire is strong, they serve with the empire, and when the empire is weak, they start robbing it. And so when the empire was grinding through all the tribes that were not listening, that would try to be independent, they were all supportive, even in the Constantine and Diocletian epoch. Everything was grinded rather successfully, and all barbarians were serving the Roman Empire. The same Franks, Vandals, even the Sterichon, who destroyed them later at one of the battles. And the problem started near Adrianople, I think, when Goths not only killed the Roman Emperor, but when a person who is also very respected in Christianity, because he made a modern Christianity a religious of the Roman Empire and basically birthed the Orthodox Christianity, Theodosius. He was sent to punish those Goths, which was not too big of an issue, because if you look at the battlefield back in the day, they were pretty much uh, locked in Frakia and they were running out of resources there. But that person, I'm picking the names here, instead of fighting the Goths, he settled in the Thessaloniki and he was eating, drinking and corrupting everything around him. And then he decided instead of fighting barbarians, he decided to strike a truce with them. His poets, of course, wrote stories that he won. The leaders of uh, barbarians and Goths came. They were received in Constantinople. It was written in the books that they need in front of him. But in reality, they didn't quite. They actually joined the army. And since those times, I think, the leaders who are not broken, who are not defeated, but they were taken into the army, they actually started uh, giving grief to the empire and either starting rebellions with the, under Theodosius. And he, they, he actually used them to fight his competitors inside the empire. So they were contributing to its uh, corruption and demise. Very soon, the man who was uh, co-opted by Theodosius and was fighting in uh, the ranks of Roman army and was considered to be pacified like Kadyrov. He eventually was one of those people who destroyed and robbed Rome. That was uh, Alaric. He didn't only rob Rome and pillage, he actually was demanding to be named the military magistrate of the whole empire. He wanted to serve. He did not want initially to pillage and he asked to serve the empire and if you it's kind of like an old story buy the brick right if you don't buy the brick i'll smash you with it it's an old story Yulia. kadyrov and prigozhin they operate under the same schema prigozhin was going towards moscow to serve it not to become the 
owner and the czar, but to serve it. It is a big topic. If you remember the battle in the Catalan fields, 451st year, they destroyed the coalition of barbarians. Romans could still do quite a bit. And their troop was also four-fifths made of the same people who were on the barbarian side. By the way, the commander who was leading Romans on the Catalan fields, he was uh, being brought at the Huns, one of the barbarian tribes in those times. So I don't think Yulia will be able to resolve fully the problem of fall of the Roman Empire. So I suggest let's go back to our matters at hand. Also about the transparency of the battlefield. One more note uh, to address that uh, blinking style of attack on the field. There is one person that I do value as a strategist, uh, Edward Ludwig. He wrote in one of his recent articles, even though he takes a very harsh position about Ukraine, he did mention that the war returned back to the sample of First World War because the battle field is transparent and no Rokossovsky, no Guderian or Rommel can prevail in the same manner as they did in the Second World War. They cannot concentrate troops in the way they did during the Second World War so that the enemy could uh, not know about it. So the tactic that you're talking about, the blinking tactic, is a pushback to Lutvak because you cannot get to the brains of commander, right? I think Lutvak doesn't understand one thing. He is playing too deep uh, in the geopolitical chess as the author of the book on uh, strategy. He is playing too much of these chess. He just doesn't understand that the world and the life is not chess. Life is more of a backgammon because it is uh, not just logic. Chess is missing luck. And life always has the element of a rational, element of uh, success and fortune. In chess, you can see the board as well, right? You can see everything, but there is no fortune. There is no chance. In backgammon and in uh, cards, when you play any card game, there is a big degree of fortune involved. It is very important whom military fortune will turn her face to and whom it will turn her back to. I have my opinion and I've expressed it many times and I think that the more army sticks to the owner and to playing by the rules, the more fortune favors the army. And the more the army turns away from that, the fewer time they will see fortune in their life. And I'm trying to explain to all those idiots who heavily criticize some of the things I'm saying that you need to like, you need to follow military owner just to make sure that fortune favors you more often, if not for anything else. All right, let's go back to fortune a bit later, but I do want to touch upon one more thing. You did mention that near Kharkov, Russian army withdrew. Near Kherson, Russian army withdrew. The modern, today, Ukrainian tactic is based on a certain principle. They don't want Russian army to withdraw and retreat. Yulia, it is very nice to have business to, make, to be doing business with a smart lady. Yeah, what I wanted to say here is that here's the problem, as you mentioned. If in Russian battalion 40% are gone, dead and wounded, their leader will still report upstairs that the battalion repelled the attack without going into details of how many of them are left. I will open you a little funny mystery here, Julia. In the uh, post-Soviet army and Russian army, they neglect real numbers. Of a, on paper, it may still be a battalion, even though in real life there would be, for example, just a commander, their driver, and maybe two assistants, and that's it. And that's the weakest, the, the Achilles heel of all the post-Soviet military school. They don't report actual numbers. So, Yulia, once again, you surprise me. It is real nice to be dealing with somebody who does not pretend to be smart, who actually is smart. Alexei, I'm sorry, <laughs> let's stop it, I am blushing now. Uh, okay, so what the problem is that, that was the idea in Kherson attack. We wanted to physically destroy Russian army on the right bank, but they managed to leave their positions on the right bank and move to the left. We'll talk about uh, why 
and reasons after the war. I think there will be a lot of very interesting streams after the war that will allow to see many events in a different light. But on certain, due to certain reasons, they managed to leave the right bank. Is Gerasimov smart on the Russian side? No, 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 not Gerasimov. And I don't want to go into detailed lies here. But right now we are not going to let them retreat. We are solving not just a task of advancing, we're also solving two more difficult tasks, which make the whole problem much more interesting. First, we need to make sure we are still battle capable when we get to the borders of Crimea and the Azov Sea, when we'll break this corridor that they have to supply their southern front. We need to be still battle worthy, battle capable. We don't need to just reach the sea, fall and die there. So that's number one. Second, we don't want to let Russian troops leave or retreat. They all need to die there. Every invader needs to perish in our land so that even the hottest of hotshots who love cheating and telling Putin all the stories in a favorable light, that they would understand that they will not be able to do any winter campaign, that they will all die on our occupied territories. So these are two main tasks. First, to take the territory back, stay capable, and then also destroy the enemy entirely. This is the main goal, to grind through our enemy. And speaking of Lutwak and his books, there was an interesting transition. Remember, the Roman army was trained, prepared to basically attack the enemy in a certain way to grind through the enemy's forces and destroy them all one by one. What is a Roman tactic? You're carrying that shield with a round thing in the middle. They're throwing their own pilums at the shields of the opposing enemy, and pilum sticks their shields. It uh, has a long metal part, so you cannot cut it off easily. And it was uh, much of a hurdle for the enemy, so many of them dropped their shields. And the Roman shield allowed for some maneuvering with it, and then they were pushing the enemy with the shield, and were hitting them with a small gladiator sword on the right. And sometimes it uh, hit his own enemy, sometimes the neighbor next to, to the right of him. And there were three classic Roman strikes in the neck, in the armpit, and in the leg uh, to cut the artery. And going like this, they grinded the enemies into abyss. There was uh, nobody left after that. And the Byzantine Roman Empire, they met a different enemy. They met uh, horse-mounted barbarians who also were using bows, so their legion had issues getting to them at first. And also, sometimes they were for you, sometimes they were fighting against you. And Byzantine Empire had to change things and to start react operatively different. And basically the idea was to put the enemies into conditions where diplomacy and politics will turn them from enemies into allies. They, back in the day, made an impressive development. Many people are discounting them, many historians saying they're not as uh, amazing as Roman Empire, but they actually did a lot of development to remain alive. And during the whole history, maybe there were only a couple times where countries could make, change their modus operandi so much. They created horse-mounted armies, they actually hired barbarians to train them to shoot and use the arrows. So there was a, a different uh, interesting development there. In our case, we're solving a different task. We are basically, one of our tasks is to grind all the Russian troops on that uh, southern front. Many people did not understand what is really going on. And Russians are trying to create three different armies. 18th, 25th, and one more that was supposed to be created through the Western military district, through Moscow and Leningrad military district. Now the dates are being pushed out, they're not really making them on time, and more parts of these future armies are being pulled apart to plug the holes in the front. So they're not really on time creating them, and we basically, our goal is to keep grinding them, so they physically run out of resources. This is our task, to grind them through so there is nobody left. And then, after they all are destroyed, it's not so difficult to get to the sea. 
So it's not about capturing uh, or liberating the captured land, it's about destroying the enemy. And it's interesting that some Yulia Latinina is asking me that exact question. I don't remember anybody picking this up from the strategic dispositions and all. I think I heard that somewhere, Alexei. I don't think I'm the only one. Well, you heard because I did mention it in uh, general. So, okay, I have a question to you. If somebody breaks through the defense line, if somebody manages to break through the defense line and reserves of the enemy are still untouched, then they may find themselves in the same position as Paulus, who captured Stalingrad, right? So did, did the strategy help? Uh, right, so one of the features of this uh, current southern uh, front is that they do have that 35th army sitting there waiting for uh, extreme situations where they need to be thrown to plug uh, the holes in the front. But I suspect they'll be torn apart way before they can be used as a single entity. And then, okay, imagine we broke through, they're starting to do the frontal assaults as well. They're trying to counterattack during our attacks. And this basically is exactly that. This is the same grinding tactics. So this is the perfect way for us to destroy them, because when they move towards us, they'll have to form columns, and then we can use cluster munitions to destroy them. So yeah, this train is on fire. It just takes time to grind through all of them, and it is not an easy task for us as well. Let's be honest. But regardless, the task is still there, and we still have the task to physically grind them down. So when in the West they're measuring by the kilometers liberated, this is one of the main mistakes of uh, Western military analysts, um, God bless them. We don't need kilometers, we need numbers, we need to destroy the enemy. You actually made a good uh, comparison earlier, Alexei. You could have 10 lines of defense with a lot of reserves and stuff. If you concentrate things together and break through in one spot, and the enemy has a bunch of different uh, fortifications, even if you break through them in one location, you will be basically in a sack. You'll be facing enemy's reserves, and uh, the overall situation on the front will not change, right? Right. So this is... Um, also, another means that we used to change a different, uh, change the situation in our favor is the way we are grinding through. We have the protrusion forming on the front in the center that increases the overall length of our front, that makes it more difficult for them to defend. And then once we reach, let's say, Takmak, where the 35th Army is, we might as well form two more protrusions that in, surround them on both sides and it'll make it more difficult to defend as well. Right, so I think the war for exhaustion that Ukrainian troops are conducting, it's very different from the exhaustion war that we've seen it during the Second World War. And, by the way, correct me if I'm wrong here, Alexei, from that war for exhaustion that Russian army is doing right now, comparing the way two armies do that. Since we are talking about systemic military things, please elaborate how it is different, and we can continue. Okay, so near Kupinsk uh, is a little different situation. Russian troops near Kupinsk, uh, which actually have more numbers there than Soviet Union had in Afghanistan, they had uh, about a hundred. Oh, they have about a hundred thousand and nine hundred tanks in the Kupinsk area. They started to form that offensive in the area that is not suitable for such way to attack that they were planning, because these are this is a very hilly. Uh, it's th this terrain is full of hills and ravines, and it's not easy to attack on the area like that. So in order to move in the areas like this, you probably need 10 times more resources than they have, because it's very easily to be shot at from three different sides at any moment. It's very reminiscent of uh, what was happening in Kiev region when they were forming columns and they were being destroyed on March. This is a, not exactly like Kiev, but very close to that, and it's difficult to realize their numerous advantage in that area. So they're solving their political task. 
If they would have moved all these 100,000 from the northeast and moved them to the front, that's when we would feel it. That would be more difficult for us to do anything on the south. But they have government politics that basically tells them to continue actions near Kupensk and to fight against uh, a much smaller army of uh, Ukraine, which is not only successfully defending in this terrain, but also is uh, conducting counterattacks. So Russian army is not only in their offensive maneuver mode there, but uh, they've been in that offensive for a while now, and they have very little success. And we don't even have the, elite, the most elite troops there. They're brave, great troops, but they're not the most trained troops that we have. And our advantage is usually in high precision weapons, in strike drones, in intel means and measures. Russia doesn't have that. Russian only advantage is in numbers, in quantities. But in order to grind the enemy, these days you, need, you also need qualitative advantage, not just quantitative advantage. Because what's happening right now, we are destroying their artillery and winning counter-artillery counter fire because we have much more accurate measures to wage this kind of fight. And we're doing it everywhere, on all parts of the front. When people are saying that, yeah, no, we'll draw their attention to one part of the front and then do the strike on the other part of the front, no, this was not the exact uh, strategy we used. This would be an EDSC to repeat the same thing. Um, and we've been accused that, why are you fighting like this? The enemy knew that you will be down there in the south and you'll be fighting there. But I would say this is good. This is like Svetoslav the Brave, who was not running after his enemies on the steps. He would attract them so they would come to him. So we know that they would be coming, that they would be waiting for us. And we, we like it. We want them to be there to be able to destroy them. And of course, we knew about the Kupensk area that they will be doing countermeasure there. But um, yeah, that's good. We That's how we keep grinding through them. They do have some troops that they could have moved from the front and tried to throw it to the south to reinforce it, but that needed to be done before, uh, not during or after, because uh, right now the front is huge, it takes time to move troops, and when they're engaged elsewhere, it's nearly impossible to withdraw them from that part. And our main task near Bakhmut, near Kupinsk, and in the south is to destroy the enemy. We are not there to liberate territories and count everything in miles. We will get there, but our first task is to destroy the enemy. Our task is to take away their capability to wage war. And we're looking at the new detachments they form. They have maybe 50% of equipment that they should have. And they look more and more like militia or volunteer corps than the professional army. And this war will cost them dearly. For the one who didn't think deep and decided to start it, will understand that Putin may uh, find that by the next presidential elections, where he is hoping in the United States, where he is hoping that Trump may get to power, he will have no resources to fight war by that time. And when they're scaring everybody that they'll do mobilization in Russia, mobilization never ended. They continue doing it. And Putin has his own elections in March, and another big wave of mobilization will definitely be a hurdle in this process. And then another question, okay, you mobilize them, what arms do you give them? Slingshots, right? Alexei, newest slingshots bought in China? I think, yeah, that, that would be a good story for them. On the other hand, I think we shouldn't be giggling on them too much about exhaustion. I was asking different people, Alexei, and I have one idea that I want to test on you. How Ukrainian tactics work in the same, let's say, Rabotny part of the front. There are Russian fortifications that are taken by Ukraine, after which they are being attacked by Russian artillery, and Russian artillery is being then destroyed by counter-battery, counter-artillery fire. And because Ukraine has more accurate artillery, Russian artillery is being depleted slowly. Second, when Russian troops are advancing near Kupinsk or trying to attack there, they don't have high precision artillery, so they advance with armor. I understand, right? And on the first look, 
It seems not exactly the right way to do it, because when, remember, Ukraine used some armor, a lot of uh, numbers of it got destroyed. So, of course, they use armor, and high-precision Ukrainian artillery destroys their armor. But after that, Russian Lancet, uh, UAV, since they don't have a precision artillery, they have Lancets, and that gets to high-precision Ukrainian artillery and destroys it. And I think these two, mach two mechanisms are somewhat on par with each other. Um, I don't think each of them is uh, silly, neither one nor the other. They're just adjustments of both sides to the way they can fight this war. Correct, but first of all, lead sets are small in numbers. They don't have enough UAVs of that type. They cannot nowhere near uh, be the numbers of UAVs we use. Even the very cursory accounting on the front, on the south, shows that we are uh, losing one-to-one -one over there. In classic uh, war fighting, if you are advancing, you should be losing three times more, right? And probably even more than three. What is a successful offensive if you're not lucky as we were near Kharkov? It's when we broke through their defense, but we have lost five to their one. But we still gathered enough resources and broke through the front. But when it is one for one, that definitely gives no compliment to the defending side. But it's a good uh, stats for the offense, uh, offending side, for the attacking side. So what landsets are? They're just like their name. It's a surgical instrument. This is not a mass-used weapon. This is a special. Is used by special detachments of GRU. There are special trained uh, small detachments that use them whenever they get a window. Uh, but this is not a game-changing weapon. This is very small tactical group that knows maybe a couple of them are there on the front that are trying to catch our armor um, when they can. And they're limited in doing that. So while being an effective weapon, it is a very limited one. Unlike our artillery, that is resolving a lot of tasks on the whole line of the front. And, you know, near Robotino, for example, they did fortify. They're hoping to hold us and destroy our armor. Do you think it'll help them? Because we can walk around it. We don't need to storm them up front. Okay, um, another one. So, press secretary of NATO did mention recently that uh, NATO is looking to maybe accept Ukraine, if Ukraine would be eager to abandon some of its territories and trade them for membership in NATO. So, right now, I think these conversations though, are not addressing two important factors. Putin is in his uh, state of euphoria, because he's not being reported the truth. He thinks everything is great on the front, his troops are in the offensive mode near Kupinsk, they're perfectly defending in the south, and he will soon go into winter, he will aggregate enough UAVs and will continue destroying Ukraine's infrastructure with shakeheads. So he's like Chinese emperor during the Opium Wars, is uh, completely incoherent thinking that his troops are winning. At some one hand. On the other hand, why Ukraine would want to talk anything peace on the verge of big strategic of success. Well, we, Yulia, we definitely don't, uh, are not going to hit truce, uh, peace truce uh, with Russia. I will remind, remind you of the words of Zaluzhnik, who expressed the moods of the army that I will enter Crimea and nobody will stop me. Yeah, we have, of course, deficiencies and our own issues that can be addressed and attacked for hours, but we, are, we do know what we're doing. And one of the main problems of the West is that Every time before the possible negotiations can start, they start to slow down the supply of arms to us because they still believe in the Copenhagen Convention that prohibits the parties uh, arranging the negotiations from supporting one side or another side. And they really start to slow down the supply of military nomenclature when the conversations about negotiations arise. And Putin knows it. He's continuing to peddle all these negotiation options. And he's trying to create these negotiation platforms everywhere, on the border with Poland and in the south with a Green Deal, everything. And in each negotiations, the main ask that Russian side is looking for is to limit military support of Ukraine. And that's how he's biding time. 
And when, when West will realize that you can continue negotiating with Putin, officially, unofficially, just don't slow down your military support tempo. If you are not slowing us down, we will be able to resolve the problem of Putin militarily. And he can aggregate a ton of landsets and indeed tear up some of our civilian infrastructure. But on the battlefront, he will have nobody left. Because if he will continue fighting, we will continue fighting. And our task is to really finish him at the battlefront. And for that, one needs to continue supplying us with the right nomenclature. Just continue, keep doing what you're doing. And Berdyansk recently, we had a really good hit, right? So we're continuing to destroy their stuff. And not, not even these high-tech things that we use here and there when we can, but just the regular mechanized artillery, mechanized armor, um, all kinds of weapons for the infantry. Our main goal of this operation, please listen to me, hear me, that we don't need to run to the sea and then exhaust ourselves. Our main ideation is to physically destroy their army so there would be nobody to continue waging this war. And that's where we're guiding them to. And we'll guide them to the end of it. They'll have no troops capable of fighting this war. Not only attacking, but even defending. Yes, there can be some parity and they can uh, bite us from air with their missiles and try to destroy our grain infrastructure and energy infrastructure. So they will be attacking us from the air, but we will be destroying them fully on the ground. And when your ground is gone, your air strikes will not be that decisive, really. They And, and plus, we do have some techniques to counter their attacks as well. So that's where it goes. Okay, Alexei, so from what you said, on the other hand, Putin, I don't know how endless his resources are, but he indeed can mobilize a lot of people. Yulia, they're missing arms. They don't have enough arms to arm them. And I was quoting Lutvak before, I think he's suggesting a very uh, provoking concept to push Ukraine into the painful spot. If this is an existential war for Ukraine, let them mobilize 10% of their population, like Israel did. Well, he thinks we what? We cannot uh, mobilize 10% of our population? Well, but who's paying those bribes to military commissars to not join the army? You know, these people always exist. We're like usual society. There are people who want to avoid being drafted, right? But... To address Lutwak's point, does he understand that we near Robotina are conducting offensive with smaller number of troops against a larger number of Russian troops? Right now, battle worthiness of Russian troops, and we're talking about professional ones, just like 810 uh, brigade of uh, Marines that they have, which already exchanged, changed their troops three times, and the last time they barely managed to get enough people. They already need to count three to one. In order to stop one Ukrainian detachment, they need to throw three Russian detachments. And what will happen when they'll be more mobilized instead of professional? Then they'll be five to one, six to one? Where else can you see that the defense is broken by smaller numbers? And that's what's happening in the south. We're breaking their positions with smaller numbers because their real battle worthiness is crumbling. It's already down and if they continue mobilizing, they may have for a tank battalion, what, seven tanks instead of 32? And that battalion will not be able to do anything, any of the tasks they will give uh, to it as a tank battalion. So Ukraine will grind through that as well, and then they will have really nothing left. Okay, let me then bring one more thing. You did mention a phrase that the one who is more noble, who follows the rules of engagement, and uh, behaves in a more civilized manner, usually faces uh, luck more often than uh, otherwise. And I would say, I would agree here, because Putin's main drawback was near Bucha, that really destroyed his image. I would wanna, also wanted to mention that in Scandinavian folklore, they even measured a special l feature, a special parameter for their troops. Uh, what well, is he like you or not? 
Um, oh, Yulia, yeah, yeah. Sea captains had, I think Britain has uh, a special um, characteristic. Are they lucky? Is the captain lucky or not? And I think German uh, submariners also had the same uh, officially tracked parameter. Oh, so they might have taken it from the Scandinavian uh, traditions. Okay, interesting. So this is my favorite topic that I usually try to touch upon. Um, I usually try to go and look in the historic background and I'm trying to bring examples of some of the European uh, knights who behaved, one would say, counterintuitively. And it's not even about that. Uh, when the knight was captured, uh, the capture actually served him wine and food at the table. But very often, the steps that they were making are actually looking very silly from today's standpoint. But, for example, your opponent, Empress Matilda, takes a castle and Stefan Blaski is trying to lay a siege to the castle. And then she says, OK, let me out. I'm leaving the castle. And she's being let out. So she could go. And then she goes and gets new supporters because it's not uh, nightlike to hold the damsel in uh, the castle, right? Yeah, it's it's an old knight, knighthood uh, style. When the French and uh, English also bumped into each other in the fog, there was a situation and the French officer said, Englishman, you fire first. Um, and he died as a result of it, but they still did the knight, the, that knightly behavior, they conducted that. And there was one thing with the knightly behavior that it was always mutual. It was always done from both sides. If your enemy did not if the enemy did not express nightlight behavior, if, for example, your opponent was uh, uh, Valon Duffet, who was invited to the king's castle, and instead he got there at night and cut everybody whom he could, that was not uh, appreciated. So when he was captured, he was not treated as a knight. He was cut in four pieces and hung on the wall. So if Putin... Why am I saying that? If Putin would play by the rules of the game, there would be no questions. But what do you do with the enemy who creates Bucha and doesn't follow any military rules on engagement? Same thing, you just need to destroy them. Do you understand, Yulia, that effectivity and morale are connected on the battlefront? They're immediately connected because the troops that are fighting for values are fighting more are fighting way better than the troops that fight on emotions. Values organize intellect, brains, emotions, material means, relations, and the troop, everything. Somebody who is fighting for values will always prevail over the ones who are fighting on the emotions with other things equal. It's just a higher level of organization of human labor, if you want to use Marxist uh, terms and a way to organize productivity and grow GDP. And that's it. Those, those who ever reached anything from those who built Panama Canal or those who stormed the South Pole or those who built some impressive uh, historical milestones or, you know, even Soviets when they launched Gagarin, they had values. So all these achievements were done for values. Without values, you cannot land on the moon, you cannot build Panama Canal, you cannot build anything great. Well, that's exactly, Alexei, what Putin, I think, is doing. He is pushing the world back in the dark past and uh, in the world of emoting emotions, not in the world of values. Correct, Yulia. Back in the history when uh, Kievan uh, rulers, for some reason, got to those tribes in the northeast, in uh, northeast swamps, and they somewhat civilized them and let it out. Those tribes actually had some cannibalism and some very dark cults of war, and they did affect everybody in the region. But when the enemy is civilizationally higher than those cannibals, when the enemy is more organized, is fighting for better ideals and higher civilizational setup, then the cannibals start to lose. The order and the rules of engagement actually imply that the enemy needs to be destroyed in the fastest and most effective way possible without causing additional suffering. 
and that is probably just a better way to motivate oneself if you have better values. And um, that's how we do. We we destroy them until while well, they have have weapons in their arms. When they surrender, then of course they go into the different status. They become prisoners of war, and we treat them respectfully. But until until they drop weapons, they're the legit target, and we're destroyed trying to destroy them in the most effective manner. And also in the rules of engagement, there are other rules. They don't shoot at the Red Cross. If you see it on the field, you don't destroy wound, uh, shelters with wounded, you don't destroy civilians. And I, you know, all that nobility also is an interesting aspect. Um, I'm remembering one uh, classic, I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but uh, trainee was remembering an advice of old seamen that uh, when we have luck, we are all gentlemen. And we have no luck, there are no gentlemen. And here's a moral question. How long can you remain a gentleman? Because when you run out of luck, many of them will turn pretty barbaric. So the fo your real force is to remain a gentleman, even when circumstances are dire. And that's when the fortune comes back to you. That's when you start throwing your dices better every time. And every serious person who seriously tried to research this topic knows that uh, interesting phenomena. I can even tell you a historic anecdote on this topic. Yes, please, and I think that'll be a good uh, final for this stream, right? Okay, medieval fight is going on, one army completely obliterated the other, and the king, who was uh, the leader of the winning army, already took his helmet off, and he sees uh, at about 300 yards on the hill, one guy is fighting completely surrounded by his troops. And he gives an order, okay, bring me this guy. He sent 10 bodyguards and he killed all of them. He's like, wait a second, send 30. He destroyed 30. Amazing. So do, do whatever you want, just bring me that guy. So they figured a way to wound him with three arrows, got some ropes on him and brought him to the king. And the king told, tells him, hey, as a king, I completely respect the way and the style of your fighting. What are you fighting for? What, what drives you? And he's like, how can you how can you fight like that? And the guy, very tired and wounded, says, you know, I'm fighting for money. I'm, that's it. I'm a hired gun. And the king is amazed, amazed, and he uh, says, how can you how can you do that? Uh, my troops are fighting for honor. So the guy asks the king, what are you fighting for? For honor? Uh, well, you know, your majesty, everybody fights for what you don't have. And on this uh, remarkable story, this was Yulia Latina and Alexei Rostovich. We did not talk about many things, but that's okay. We'll talk next week, right? Absolutely. We will be here next week at that same time. And I did appreciate the depth of conversation. And I think the crackling and crumbling that are happening in the South, they deserved our attention and description. Alexei, thank you very much. Thank you and see you. До встречи.